Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being with us here at the Cincinnati Observatory. I'm Mark Nykirk, and I direct the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU. Here's our little advertisement. Uh, what we do is try to connect the campus and the community in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of is connecting classes to community projects. So if you think about uh, an internship, which is an individual, service learning involves sort of the whole class in an internship. So once we were here and we did a, a, a museum a class in public history on museum tourism, created a, a STEM day for adolescent uh, girls. Uh, and so we set up on the grounds outside and uh, our students designed a, a, a whole afternoon of activities, uh, including inviting uh, women in the sciences. Uh, a veterinarian, that's kind of obvious, but we also had somebody, a meteorologist, who said, I, I gotta be, have my presence on TV, but if I don't know the science, I can't do this job. And a woman from the uh, art museum who does uh, uh, restoration of paintings, it's chemistry. So uh, it's great to be back here tonight. The Cincinnati uh, uh, Observatory has been so welcoming. Uh, this season of Six at Six, and Six at Six is designed to bring uh, the fantastic research of our faculty and students to the community. And this season, we're trying to be in venues that are related to the topic. So we called the observatory and they said, sure, come on out and uh, gave us a room. So uh, I'm glad to be here uh, for that. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, our speaker uh, will have his remarks and then we'll have questions afterward. If you're uh, in person, just raise your hand and, uh, and uh, we'll call on you. And uh, virtual audience, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question in there and we'll monitor those and ask the questions in the room uh, for you. Uh, those of you who are in person, I hope you've got a little bit of time to uh, wander around the grounds here, this amazing place. Uh, and afterward, we will be here uh, uh, with a telescope, and uh, you can also go see one of the uh, historic telescopes. Uh, this is an amazing place, uh, and by the way, it was almost torn down for condo, so isn't it fantastic that it wasn't? And I, I want to introduce you to uh, uh, Craig uh, Nimai, who is the manager here, and he can tell you that a little bit of the history here much better than I can. It's a great story. Thanks, Mark. Good evening. Welcome to our in-person and to our virtual audience. I'm Craig Nimai. Currently, I've got several roles here. Currently, the collections museum collections manager, formerly executive director, volunteer, docent, a lot of different things. We are glad you're here tonight, and especially this year as we're celebrating our 150th year of being in this wonderful Samuel Hanford Design Building. The observatory itself dates back to 1843 when we were originally on top of Mount Adams, when John Quincy Adams came out to Cincinnati to dedicate what would be the first public observatory. It was such a significant event for the city, for our region, for our nation, that he made a very arduous trip to get here. And we have several of our docents here this after this evening, so if you have any questions about the history of the observatory, we'll be doing mini tours, Q&A, showing off the two historic telescopes. We'll see if the weather cooperates. We have a few people in charge of the weather. Uh, our, second, uh, our second director, Cleveland Abbey, actually gets credited for starting the National Weather Service, so we're hoping we can brag about that here a little bit and it'll clear up. If not, it is not our fault. It's <laughs> Cleveland Abbey. Again, we are glad you're here. Great to be working with NKU again. It's been a while. The event we did with you guys, with your students, we're still using a lot of those posters and materials they came up with for the Women of Wonder. Just a wonderful group to work with, and we're looking forward to doing more. And before I get carried away and really get started, I'm going to step out of the room and we can get started. Thank you again for everybody coming. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to turn you over to uh, Dr. Dirk Grupa, who, uh, uh, well, one thing I want to tell you, if you go to his office, it's a great deal of fun. In addition to all the science that he does, he's a model maker and there's all these satellites uh, hanging all over the place, so uh, it's okay if everybody comes to your office. Sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, we've been working with an international team uh, and discovered things about black holes that we didn't know, and you're about to hear about it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me here tonight. Thanks to the observatory for hosting this, and thanks everybody for coming. So what I'm going to do is I will talk about a black hole that is named OJ-287, and what OJ-287 stands for I will talk with you in a second. 
Uh, I will also talk a little bit about black holes in general, why we know or how we know that they exist, how we can prove they exist, and where this whole thing is even coming from. Uh, the whole idea about black holes before I dive into OJ-287. Has anybody has an idea what the O in OJ-287 stands for? Any suggestion? Which state are we in? <laughs> <laughs> it is really Ohio, because Ohio State in the 1960s had an observatory, a radio observatory called the Big Ear. And they did a radio survey, so they looked all over the sky. And in order to make some sense out of it, or you know, to catalog the source, the, all the radio sources out there, they named the radio sources by fields. So they had field A, B, C, D, and so on. And so there was a field J. Well, there's Ohio J, and then OJ-287 became the 287th source on that uh, on that on that survey, and that's where this name is coming from. But Talking about black holes, black holes, believe it or not, are the simplest object in the universe. If a black hole would do something bad and you need an eyewitness, well, everybody can describe a black hole very simply because all you know about the black hole is its mass, how fast this thing rotates, so what the spin is, and theoretically an electric charge. That's all you need to know about the black hole. All the other information that passes through what we call the event horizon, and we'll talk about that later on, is gone. If you had some Klingon battle cruiser that falls into the black hole, it's gone. If you have some star that is erupted, disrupted, falls into the black hole, it's gone. We don't care about what matter is in there. All that matter is the mass. That's kind of funny, right? All that matter is the mass. So where's the original idea from, of black holes coming from? It comes from Albert Einstein. Um, although he was never convinced that there were black holes because Black holes are so strange because they isolate themselves from the rest of the universe. Now, Einstein was born 1879 in Ulm in Germany. He moved to Switzerland, got a PhD in physics uh, at the Polytechnikum, later on the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, that's what ETH stands for, and uh, finally got a permanent position at the patent office. He didn't get a faculty position because at the days it was already difficult to find faculty positions. Ask somebody who graduates these days how difficult that is. Um, <laughs> well, the, the story about Einstein is, so he got this position at the patent office and uh, what took other people 12 hours to work on, well, Einstein got it done in about three. So which means Einstein had a lot of time to think about things and he was able in 1905 to publish four important papers. One of them contains the special theory of relativity, um, which you know talks about light. It talks about that light has a definite velocity, of, a, a, a constant velocity of 300,000 kilometers per second. And he did this in this paper, which is titled Zur Elektrodynamik im Bewegter Körper. So if you don't speak German, but you're looking for something that might look like relativity or special or whatever, it's not in there, right? Well, no, because he's talking about electrodynamics and about uh, the Maxwell equations which describe electrodynamics and how to merge them together with Newton's laws if you deal with something that is moving because there was a problem coming up and Einstein solved this by introducing the special theory of relativity. Einstein moved on and it took him about, uh, it took him about another 10 years in order to go from a constant velocity that is dealt with in the special theory of relativity to a more general approach when you deal with accelerations, because typically your motion is, of course, acceleration, right? So he came up with a general theory of relativity, but it took him 10 years. And the reason for this is because the mathematics is very complicated. Um, Einstein didn't understood it. He actually had a race with David Hilbert in Göttingen, um, another famous person from Göttingen. Um, so he had a race with him and Einstein beat him. Einstein beat him by about roughly about a week or two. So Einstein um, was able to find the solution for the general theory of relativity to describe accelerating bodies and with this also gravity. And I get to this part later on when we talk about black holes. Um, in November 1915, he gave a talk, a very famous speech at the uh, Prussian Academy of Science in Berlin in Germany in November 1915, and he found the solution for it. 
And this time in his paper, which was published in 1916, über die Grundlagen der allgemeinen Relativitätstheorie. Yeah, there's the word relativity in there, right? <laughs> so this time he's actually talking about this and allgemein is general. So general theory of relativity is right in this title. And again, it took Einstein, if I will show you the equation later on, that you need the Einstein field equation. I don't understand it. Um, one faculty member in my, uh, in my fac for my faculty in my department, she probably understands it. What do you think? Yeah, Shaman, she does, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't, um, and Einstein didn't uh, at first, so um, I'm not feeling too bad about it. <laughs> so what is the consequence here? What is the uh, quintessence of the general theory of relativity? That is the curvature of space-time. And that is really the quintessence that we need for discussing black holes. Um, one of the consequences is light bending. So when Einstein, when you postulate a, a theory, you need something to falsify or to, quali or to, to, um, to verify this. And one of the predictions is a process that is called light bending. And this is simply, simply coming from the curvature of space-time that is created by masses. Now, the sun has a mass, right? It's pretty massive. It has about 2 times 10 to 30 kilograms, so a very large number. How we know this number, I will talk with you guys in a second too. Um, so what happens around the sun is, well, the space-time continuum gets bended. So what the consequence is, if you look at starlight that is coming around the sun, oops, that is coming around the sun, um, well, it will bend starlight around it. So here's the earth, there's the sun, there's some star. If you have a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse, well, you can see all the sudden stars, right? Who saw the so total eclipse in 2017? Okay, good. And on uh, April 8th next year, you have another chance to see it. Not so far. You drive up two hours north from here and you will be, maybe only an hour, it's a little bit north of uh, Dayton. And you will be able to see the totality. Do that. Don't stay here because here you only see 98%. You will say, that's yeah, good enough for me. No, it's not, no. <laughs> you really want to see the totality because you see everything. You see all of a sudden that the birds come down. You see the little shades from the leaves, etc. You see the prominences around the sun. It's just gorgeous, it's just cool. So you want to do that. So anyway, uh, there was a very, very long solar eclipse. Typically, they last for a few minutes. When we had the one in 2017, that was uh, two minutes, two and a half minutes. The one next year is about the same length. I think it's roughly three minutes or so. It's a little bit longer. This one was more than six minutes. The maximum you can get is about seven minutes. So uh, a British astronomer, Arthur Eddington, who worked with, by the way, he was the other person who understood Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, he went to an island in Western Africa. I know that's like a song from Japan uh, from the 1980s. So Principe is this island. and. Uh, the path of totality went over this island. So he was able to use photographic plates to observe stars next to the sun. And here are some little marks, if you can see them, that marks the stars. And when you compare the positions of these stars with, uh, with positions taken during nighttime, so when the sun is not around, well, guess what? This, the positions of these stars have shifted. So that was a confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity. After this, Einstein was all over the place, all over the news, and became the first pop star of, um, of, of physics. And that is the Einstein field equation that also, as a consequence, um, says or predicts that this will be, oh, hello. <laughs> 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 that also predicts that um, that there will be black holes. Again, Einstein was very doubtful about the existence of black holes. He and uh, Arthur Eddington was very were very doubtful about it because they thought these things are so strange they shouldn't exist. But in a matter of fact, they actually do. When we talk about black holes, we have to go another 200 years back in time and we have to talk about this gentleman over here. That's Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was born in the same year when Kepler, uh, Johannes Kepler died. Um, he developed classical mechanics. One thing before Newton was that people could describe phenomena in physics only by phenomenologically. They could put it in words, like when, when Kepler was describing the orbits of planets, he only said, well, planets move in ellipses. Planets, the vector between the planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal time. Well, 
that is not really mathematical or you cannot really describe it, it's correct, but what Newton did is he comes up with the laws, he developed the mathematics actually to be describing this. Um, Newton did this all in one year, 1666. Einstein had a year, 1905, where he publishes four, four papers, which is considered to be an annus mirabilis, so the miracle year. Newton had the same thing in 1666. Guess what happened in uh, England in 1666? They had the plague, and they had a pandemic. What do you do during a pandemic? Well, you get away from everyone. We have experience with that, right? Okay, so you get away from everybody, Einstein, uh, Einstein, Newton went to the countryside. He was totally isolated, no internet whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was not distracted, he couldn't work on this stuff and he was, the, uh, was uh, deriving his theory of mechanics, so he derived his uh, three laws of motion plus gravity as well. And that really is the foundation, when we talk about black holes, this gives us the first access or where people could think about black holes because now the method really exists, now the physics really existed for this. So let me start with this, let me start with a ball like this. So what happens if I release this ball? It falls, it falls down, why does it fall down? Gravity. Okay, gravity, thank you. It takes about what, about one second to fall down, okay? So now imagine I'm taking this ball and I'm throwing this ball. I'm not doing this in here because I don't want to hit somebody. <laughs> How long does this ball take to fall down? One second, exactly. So if I'm shooting now faster, I throw this thing faster, how long does it take to fall down? One second. Well, at some point, the curvature of the Earth comes into play, right? Yeah. So uh, at some point, I can reach a velocity that is so fast that when I'm dropping this ball, the ball is in free fall, right? Okay, so at some point, the ball is falling all the time, but it's so fast that it will never reach the Earth again. In this moment, I'm in orbit. Keep this in mind, because we need the orbits uh, in order to measure masses, okay? We'll need this later on. So there are two velocities which are important. One thing is the circular velocity, which is the one to bring something into orbit, right? We learned this. When you do this for the Earth, that's about eight kilometers per second. So about five miles per second. Now the next velocity is, well, it's the escape velocity, okay? Let's say I want to bring something to Mars, then I have to get out of the Earth's gravitational field in order to do this. The Earth's gravitational field has a sphere of influence up to about a million kilometers away from us. So that's about three times or two and a half times the distance to the moon. So if we bring something to the moon, we are still in the Earth's gravitational field. But if I want to throw this to Mars, if I could, I would be super rich, right? Because every boys ball team would hire me, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be a home run anymore, it would be homework, right? <laughs> so, so if I throw this thing to Mars, I have to overcome gravity. And that is what we call the escape velocity. And that is a little bit more, that's about 11 kilometers per second. Um, and uh, so that's 11 kilometers per second. I don't want to bother you too much with the equations but I want to tell you where the stuff is coming from and how we can me measure masses because again, measuring masses is something very, very crucial. So if I want to do this, well, there is a law in physics that is called the virial. And if I do this, I can equate the kinetic energy, take half of the potential energy and then getting an equation like this one, which is something very essential, which we need later on. So the mass can be determined by just taking the velocity and know the distance and divide this by the gravitational constant. You can do this if you want to measure the mass of the sun. How do you measure the mass of the sun? You weigh it. Yeah, how? Yeah, okay, great idea. Okay, so, you put it on your scale. yes, you put it on the scale. Guess what the sun is doing to the scale? It burns it. Yes, there's nothing left of, this, of, the, of the scale. So what you do is, you Newton's mechanics, right? So what you do is you, you measure the velocity of a body going around the sun. What body goes around the sun? The Earth, right? It's one body. So you take the velocity of the Earth going around the sun. Well, you know that, right? You can measure the distance between the sun and the, and the Earth. Well, that's about 150 million kilometers. Circumference is 2 pi the, the distance. Uh, so you can calculate that as this. How long does it take the Earth to go around? One year. You got it. So with this, we can calculate the velocity, which is distance over time, right? Okay, so when we do this, we get about 30 kilometers per second. 
So 30,000 meters per second. We square this, we uh, multiply this by the distance, divide by the gravitational constant, there's your mass. Very simple. And why is that important? Because we can apply Newton's laws throughout the entire universe. So it doesn't matter if I'm measuring some galaxy that is billions of light years away, or if I'm measuring something in our solar system, the same laws apply everywhere. Okay, so keep that in mind, we know this. Now the other thing is the escape velocity. That's our escape velocity. And why is that important? Well, we get to light, right? Because the idea of this black hole, of this dark body, that would not emit light anymore, is actually pretty old. It's more than 200 years old. And it came back from, in England, by John Mitchell and by uh, Simon Pierre Laplace in France uh, by the end of the uh, 18th century. And what they were looking for was, well, is there a body that is so compact that even light cannot escape? Well, if you know Newton's laws and you assume at the time they were assuming that light was made out of particles, which is not totally wrong. We know light has, a, has sometimes the, um, sometimes behaves like a particle. We call those particles photons. The other times it behaves like a wave. So light is kind of strange this way. So, but people were convinced at the time that they were particles. And now is my next question. What happens if I'm throwing this ball against this ceiling? Does it move on forever? It comes back, right? Because I'm not reaching the escape velocity. Correct? Thank you. I'm not reaching the escape velocity. But what happens if the Earth or some body is so compact that light, which has a velocity, which they knew at the time, of 300,000 kilometers per second, so about 200,000 miles per second, if that could hold it back and push, pulls it back. And that's what you do. You just put in the speed of light in this formula, and then you get the size of this object. When you do that, that is called also the Schwarzschild radius, which is derived by Carl Schwarzschild. I get to this later on when I get to the general theory of relativities again. So what you're getting from Newton mechanics is exactly the same result you get from general relativity. The model, however, is wrong. Sorry, because what happens here is light doesn't behave like this particle here. What is shown by Einstein is that the speed of light is always constant. So it won't behave like this. It goes, doesn't go up and come down again that you would expect from this classical picture. It would actually continue moving. So the particle cannot escape in a black hole because you have the curvature. The curvature is so strong that the curvature doesn't get any particle out of the black hole. And that is what we call the event horizon. So um, again, black holes were first uh, were described by the Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, the first relativistic uh, description of the black holes were done by Karl Schwarzschild, and I'll show this to you in a second. And then the term black hole was introduced by John Wheeler in the 1960s, and everybody loved it. That's why we had it before. It was very compact objects or whatever people came up with for names. But black hole really, I mean, synthesize it. I mean, it's really because it is a body that is so compact that light cannot escape. Um, there's Karl Schwarzschild. Karl Schwarzschild at some point was also the director in Göttingen at the observatory uh, from 1901 to 1909. Uh, then he became the director in Potsdam, close to Berlin. Um, he used this equation over here and introduced here also the Schwarzschild radius. There's the Schwarzschild radius again. Um, this is the, the term that describes the curvature. I can see this. This is the object uh, radius. This is the Schwarzschild radius. And if this becomes, if the radius becomes smaller and smaller, and this object is so compact that it gets closer to the Schwarzschild radius, the, the bigger is your curvature. The stronger are your general relativistic effects. When we do this, when we calculate this for the Earth, well, the Earth becomes a little glass marble. So if you could take the Earth and shrink it into a black hole, we cannot do this, but let's assume we could do this, it becomes about a centimeter, so half an inch. So the whole thing is about a little bit less than an inch. So a little glass marble does give you a black hole 
with the mass of the Earth. If you do this for the Sun, well, if you do this for the Sun, it's about, one, it's about three kilometers. So roughly about two miles. That would be the Schwarzschild radius of the Sun. So imagine this. If you can imagine something, some distance of two miles, that's the radius how big the Sun would appear. So you go from a radius, a, a diameter that is about one, is about a million miles in diameter, and you shrink it now to four miles. That's how drastic this becomes. Um, now, how do we know black holes exist? Well, the first thing, or actually it's not the first thing to prove this, but this is the most recent thing. We take an image of a black hole. And how do we do this? Well, we use radio telescopes. We put radio telescopes all together. This is the picture, the first picture of a black hole that was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, which are radio telescopes which are linked together all over the Earth. Um, so what we are looking at, this is the black hole, and this is what we call the photosphere around the black hole. So we can actually see this directly. This is in a galaxy called M87. M87, M stands for Messier. Messier in the uh, 18th century made a catalog of objects to avoid confusions with comets. comets. And so uh, this was one of the objects in his catalog. And it has a black hole that is about a thousand times larger than the black hole in the center of our galaxy. I'll get to this galactic center in a second. Um, so this one is also a thousand times further away. It's about uh, at a distance of what? It's about 100 million light years away. I have the number somewhere. I didn't memorize it either. But uh, what you do is you can look at this picture. This is a direct picture of the black hole. It's very, very tricky to make this. This took hundreds of people to work on this picture. It's not like, oh, OK, I'm going to a telescope. I put a camera to the telescope, and boom, I get a texture, uh, picture of the black hole. This is a highly complicated uh, process. If you have some time to spend, I would highly recommend there is a documentary about this on Netflix. Um, I think it's Netflix. It's also Hulu. Um, the Edge of Everything, I think is the name of that documentary. I don't know if anybody has seen it. Um, it's very good because it's, it's about one and a half hours and it tells you about the Event Horizon Telescope where they take telescopes all around the, the, the Earth. So over here is Hawaii, they take Antarctica, they take observatories here in Europe and they merge them all together. They synthesize the beam together and then through some mathematical uh, calculations you can actually get this picture. The most recent one came out last year. This is the galactic center, it looks similar. And again, because the galactic center is a thousand times closer than M87, the mass is smaller, it's four million times smaller, uh, it's four million solar masses, and it's 1,000 times smaller. The angular size of the black holes are the same. Because one thing to remember is that the Schwarzschild radius, well, let's put this over here, Rs is 2 gm over c square, that scales directly with the mass. So if I'm increasing the mass, I'm increasing linearly the Schwarzschild radius, right? So if this becomes a thousand times larger, then this means that the Schwarzschild radius is also a thousand times larger, right? So that's how this system works. But how do we know what the mass of the galactic center is? Well, Newton's laws. Because what, how can we measure the mass of the sun? Yeah, we look at the planets, right? The planets move around the sun, and with the velocity and the distance, we get the mass. Okay? Now, how about we do the same thing in the galactic center? And that has been done since the 1990s. That's when two groups who worked on this, one was in Garching in Germany, um, in Munich, basically, and the other one is UCLA uh, in, in Los Angeles, the University of California in Los Angeles with Andrea Gates. And uh, what they did was these two groups, they use infrared telescopes, they monitor the galactic center. So they take a photograph every month of the galactic center. So what you're looking for is the motion of the stars in the galactic center. So let's see what happens when you do that. And look at this star. Look at the star down here, this one, the yellow one. Okay. You have one orbit here after about 15 years. And now it goes around again. They have almost two orbits of this star. And when I was in Garching um, at some open house, I was at the Max Planck Institute for Exoterrestrial Physics. That's where Reinhold Genzel worked, or is still working. 
at one of the directors there. Um, they showed me one video with just, you know, after the few couple of years, and you could see that the stars were actually trying to move around some center. And with this again, you know the orbit now, right? With the orbit, you know how big the orbit is, you know the distance of the star from the center, and with that, because you know that the star takes 15 years to do one orbit, well, you are done, right? Because then again, you have the velocity, you have the distance, and with this, you get the mass, which is about four million solar masses. Bingo. So we know that black holes exist. Now, one question is, of course, when I'm telling you that the mass inside is four million solar masses, well, then you would say, well, wait a second. This could be anything, right? This could be some cluster of stars, neutron stars, so dead stars that are clustered there together. How do we know that there's really a black hole? Excellent question. But we know also the distance, right? We know that the distance is not very large. When you look at this distance here, this is only about the size of the solar system. A little bit more than the solar system, but it's about the size of the solar system. How do you cramp four million stars into a region that is not larger than the solar system? Well, you don't. Or if you do, that system would be gravitationally unstable, so it would collapse at the end of the day into a black hole. So we would end up as a, uh, as a black hole here. The other, last but not least, what we know these days are gravitational waves. They were discovered in uh, 2015. That's another prediction from Einstein's general theory of relativity because when you have moving massive bodies, they will produce these ripples in space-time. And when they merge, they, have, they will show you a much, much stronger signal. And that was actually discovered by LIGO or by the advanced LIGO. Uh, it's a gravitational wave detector. What they do is they have these, what we call a Michelson interferometers. They have these long arms. They are about four miles, four kilometers long in each direction. They have two of them. One is in Louisiana here. This is in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and this is in Hanford in Washington. And the reason why they have two of them, because they gives you a better uh, localization where the signal is actually coming from, but it also can confirm that your signal is correct. Because what they are looking for are tiny little signals, because when your gravitational wave is moving through you or whatever, it will distort you. But the distortions are minuscule. They are tiny. They are uh, millions of the diameter of an atomic nucleus. So in order to detect this, what you need is light. So what they do is they use some laser light and they precisely move the laser light, the phase difference in the laser light, so exactly that it cancels each other out. So what you have is you have these waves. Light is a wave, right? So you have the waves here. So you have one signal. The signal that is coming back is doing exactly the opposite. It was doing this, right? I know my drawings are terrible. So at the end of the day, if you add them up, it's all zero. However, when the gravitational wave goes through these arms, it shrinks or expands the arm slightly, which means you get a little phase difference here, and all of a sudden you can detect light. The problem is that the signal is so small that you have to filter this out of all the noise. If you are walking next to the uh, gravitational wave detector, they will detect your steps. It gets even worse. When you think about this one here in Louisiana, they can detect the waves that, of the Gulf of Mexico hitting the coast of Louisiana. And that is, that is noise that you have to get out. If there's a truck passing by, well, too bad. They will detect it. Wind. Yeah. So anything, wind, yes. Anything, they will detect it. So you have, to, you have to be very careful. You have to be very precise. But then in September 2015, they were able to, um, to detect it. And the signal was actually analyzed in Hanover in Germany with GEO 600. There's another small gravitational wave detector, GEO 600, because about 600 meters long. And the signal was exactly identical in both stations, in Hanford as well as in Louisiana. And when you do the calculation, what kind of black holes would produce this kind of signal, it comes out, it is about 30 solar masses. So you merge two solar, 30, sol, kilo, 30 solar mass black holes together into one. And the energy that was released was was about 10% of that mass. So about three solar masses was uh, released just in gravitational energy. It's just astonishing when you think about it. Now, OG-287 is what we call an active galactic nucleus. So when you think about it, every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center. So when, again, our galaxy has a, uh, has a supermassive black hole with about four million solar masses. So 
10% um, of galaxies are what we call active galactic nuclei because their matter streams to the center of the galaxy and gets sucked into the black hole. Now when you suck something, when you say sucked into the black hole, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be just falling into the black hole because every matter is in an orbit. As long as you are in an orbit, you are safe. Nothing will get you into the black hole. Here's my trick question for my students in my astronomy class all the time. So what happens to our orbit if the sun all of a sudden poof, becomes a black hole? What happens? Thank you, nothing. Because look at this, right? All that counts is the mass in the center. Our orbit doesn't change. And that's the same thing. When I'm dealing with matter in a galaxy, it just doesn't just fall into a black hole. You have to get rid of what we call angular momentum. So and you do this with friction. Okay? It's like you're driving your car, right? If, how do you stop your car? Friction. friction. Because you have, you have a disc, you have an air disc, you have a brake disc, and you have the brake pads, they go to the, uh, to, to, the, to the disc, and all you're doing is basically, except if you drive an electric car, or sometimes I'm doing it with my Prius too, if you have the regenerative braking, right? But if you do it mechanically, what you're doing is converting kinetic energy into heat. And that's exactly basically what we do in this, what is called the accretion disk, which is at the inner part here of the active galactic nucleus. So we can attract matter, but the matter cannot just go automatically into the black hole. In order to do this, we have to get rid of this angular momentum if we do this through friction. Now, your brake pads get hot, right? Now, guess what happens here? This thing becomes hot too, but it becomes so hot. How hot do your brake pads get? Well, a couple of hundred degrees maybe, right? Um, I don't know. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a car engineer. So, um, so what happens? So here, the temperatures are 100, several hundreds of uh, thousands of Kelvin, which means we see these things in x-rays. That's how we can find them. What I also see in, um, in about another 10% of active galactic nuclei is this thing. It's what we call a jet. That is basically a big particle accelerator. And it produces radio waves, it produces X-rays, it produces also gamma rays. So we can detect these objects throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And that's what OJ287 is. Now, when we produce the energy, when we look at an active galactic nucleus, these quasars are the most luminous objects in the universe. When you look at these objects, well, they have energies of, well, power of 10 to 38 watts. Doesn't mean much, right? The sun has four times 10 to 26 of this. So you have a trillion suns, 10 to 12, a trillion suns in there that you need in order to power this active galactic nucleus. You will say, yeah, that's okay, that's fine, you know. I mean, then I need something like a trillion stars, big deal, some galaxies right. have that. But here's your problem. The problem is when you look at the objects, when you look at how strong they vary, and this is what we call a light curve. So here you look at the brightness of the source, and this is over time here. This is an observation with an X-ray observatory called XMM. And you look how fast this can vary. Well, it varies within two hours, which also means that the, region, also means that the region out of which this light is coming cannot be larger than two hours. So it has a very, very, very compact region. So you have something that has the luminosity of a galaxy, and you squeeze this into the solar system. Again, doesn't work, right? So if you put trillions of stars into something like the size of the solar system, well, guess what? It's gravitationally unstable, right? It's not going to work. So what do you do? Well, in the 1950s, people had the right idea. This has to be something coming from accretion. And um, Saldovich, Sal Peter and Saldovich in 64 uh, suggested that it's accretion onto a supermassive object again the term is supermassive object, it's not a black hole yet because Wheeler hasn't introduced the term black hole yet. That came in 1964. Accretion is a phenomenon we see all over in astronomy. It's a process that is very, very efficient. The sun is producing energy by nuclear fusion, right? So you take hydrogen atoms and you merge them into helium. That's the process that all stars do. And it's, uh, you know, you convert about 0.7%, about 1% of the mass into radiation. There's this famous Einstein. Everybody knows this, right? Everybody knows. Everybody heard about that? So, yes, I think so, right? Okay, you know this one? 
Okay, so when you put in some mass, you get out energy. You multiply this by the speed of, again, the speed of light, speed of light square. And bingo, you get that. And when you do this in the sun, well, you, you get a luminosity of about 4 times 10 to 26 watts. The very large number, right? Um, but if you do this with accretion, your, accretion uh, your, your efficiency goes up dramatically. Because 10% can be even 30% at maximum. So you can convert a lot of gravitational energy into radiation in a very, very small, uh, dense area. To show you a little bit how dramatic this is, let's talk about mushrooms. You know, you know marshmallows? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. So you know these little marshmallows, right? They are about this big that you use for s'mores, right? OK. When you measure them, they are about 5 grams, so 0 0.005 grams. All right. Ignore the formula here, but this is how you can calculate this. So when you do this, when you take a marshmallow and you throw it into a black hole, then this is the energy that you would release, 7 times 10 to 13 joule. Anybody has an idea how much energy that is? Any suggestion? Well, the sun is, is much more luminous than that, right? Because the sun is 10 to 30, 20, uh, 26. So this is about you know, 10 to 13 times smaller than the luminosity of the sun, but it's still very, very sufficient because guess what? It's about the energy that was released from the Hiroshima bomb. So next time you play with marshmallows, be careful throwing those things into black holes. The only thing is that, uh, well, in order to power a black hole, well, this is only 10 to 13 joule, right? And we need 10 to 30, 38. So this means we need 10 to 25 or 10 to 24 marshmallows, I calculated this yesterday, if we, the number of marshmallows we need for in one second to power a black hole is actually, you have a thick layer around the earth of about 20 miles all around. So yeah, uh, lots of marshmallows. Would you like to eat that many? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, last but not least, I want to introduce you to SWIFT. SWIFT is the observatory I was working on at some point at Penn State was launched in 2004 into a low Earth orbit. And uh, what it does is detects and hunts for gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are explosions of very massive stars. So these are not stars like the sun, which is a low mass star. These are stars that have masses of 50, 60, 70 times the mass of the sun. When they explode, they not just form a neutron star, they form a black hole. So that's another thing why we know black holes really exist, because we have these gamma ray bursts. That, uh, that explode uh, and can be detected by SWIFT. SWIFT is unique because SWIFT has an optical telescope or UV optical telescope, an ultraviolet optical telescope, and it has an X-ray telescope. If you are dealing with objects like active galactic nuclei, which vary all over the place, well, then you want to have data in X-rays and the ultraviolet at the same time. Because otherwise, if you observe an X-ray one day and you observe two days later in the ultraviolet, well, you don't know what the thing was doing in the meantime. So you cannot really compare this. So this is why SWIFT is really our workhorse. So let's get to OJ-287. So what was interesting about OJ-287 was discovered here in the 1960s, 70s, that it has these rare, very regular uh, sp uh, spikes that come up every flares every 12 years. So this is how bright the source is here in the optical. And then down here you see the years. So what people did then is they went back to historical data and they found, well, this one is actually doing this for quite a while, every 12 years. Now, then the question is, well, how do you explain that? If this is just an accretion disk where matter falls into constantly into a black hole, yeah, you have some variability, but you don't expect any per periodicity here at all. When you look a little bit closer to these uh, peaks, you see that they are double peaks and they are spaced differently. So the model is, well, you could have a supermassive binary black hole. So we're not talking about a single black hole, we are talking about binary black holes. Remember the thing, the little video I showed you with the gravitational waves? That's exactly what we are looking for. So we are looking for these massive binary black holes. And they exist because we know that galaxies merge. In about five, million, five billion years, the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy will merge together because they're getting closer and closer and closer. Well, they have black holes in the center. Then the black holes become a binary system at some point. So they will move around each other. So we know these systems exist. 
And OJ-287 is one of those candidates. We cannot resolve it, but the theory from here says, well, there should be a binary system to explain those peaks. And so what happens is you have this massive black hole, and I get to this where we get the idea that this should be one of the biggest black hole in the universe come from, and we have another black hole that orbits this black hole and plunges through the accretion disk every 12 years. So that's the idea. So that can explain these flares, but there's more to it. When you look again closely, you see that these spikes have these double peaks, right? And the separation between these spikes is different. So it cannot be just a normal orbit going around because now we go back to Einstein. Because now the general theory of relativity picks up again in the system because we are dealing with, gravity, with, with uh, general relativistic effects. And the effect here that we are seeing is the rotation of the prehelium or the uh, periastron of that orbit going around this black hole. This was a prediction that comes out of the general theory of relativity. In, in, in particular, this was Einstein's confirmation that his theory was right. And he found this out one week before he gave his famous talk at the Prussian Academy in, um, in, Ber in Berlin in 1915. Uh, Einstein cited here that this was the happiest moment in his life. And because this was a known phenomenon when you look at uh, Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. And what astronomers knew was that there was a rotation of this perihelium, so the closest point of the orbit to the Sun. And they could do anything. Perturbation theory from Jupiter, from Mars, from the Earth, from Venus, whatever. Nothing could explain the entire effect. But when Einstein did the calculation, it actually worked. And that was Einstein's confirmation that he could actually find that this was actually right. And we find this around the supermassive black hole. There was a recent paper on the galactic center. Now, this is a little video. You have seen the star in the galactic center going around and around, right? So they measured the position a little bit closer, and they found actually the orbit is doing it. The position of the star of the orbit is not exactly the same anymore. So you can see that in our galactic center happening right now. So now when we go to OJ-287, don't look too much at this, but what happens is, well, what you need in order, to, what you need, the, the orbit, the, the shift in every single orbit, the periastron shift that you see in every single orbit has to be about 33 degrees. So it's not like this tiny effect that you see in Mercury, it is very significant that you see. And with that, you can actually explain the flares that you see. The only problem with that is you need a black hole in the center that requires 18 billion solar masses. And 18 solar, billion solar masses would make this object the fifth largest black hole in the universe. There are some that are higher. There's one apparently with about 40, 45 billion solar masses. But this would be, oops, this would be really a monster. But let's say this theory works, right? And you make some predictions, that's what theories do. So you come up with this model that you have a black hole, which is one of the biggest in the universe. Very cool, right? So 18 billion solar masses. The secondary black hole has 150 solar masses in, in order to make this orbit work. And uh, that is not a small one either, right? Because when you remember, this thing is 40 times larger than the black hole in our galaxy. So not small. And with this, you can actually get this spacing. The problem is you make predictions, right? That's what theories do. So the prediction was from this model, well, there should be also flares coming up last year. Okay? Now, when you have these flares, there are two different kinds of flares that you predict. One of them are these impact flares. So when the black hole, the secondary black hole, crashes into the accretion disk, absorbs some of this matter, forms its own accretion disk, makes a flare, because now it accretes matter from the, from the accretion disk very fast. And you would see this. You would see this as what we call thermal emission. Thermal emission is emission that is emitted by any hot body or any body with a temperature. Your body temperature is about 310 Kelvin, right? So um, what is it, 100 Fahrenheit, OK? So when you calculate this, you can calculate this with a law that is called Wien's displacement law. You can figure out where you would radiate. And where you radiate is in the infrared. So if I'm putting up an infrared, an infrared camera, I could clearly see you, even in the dark. You know, that's how the infrared glasses work, right? So I could do this. Now, there are also secondary flares, because 
Again, this black hole is plunging through the accretion disk, causes ripples in the accretion that moves more matter towards the jet, and then I'm increasing the emission from the jet as well. So I'm seeing two different kinds of jets, uh, two different kinds of flares. Um, and it works, it works, you know, for this part, we, they predicted there would be a flare October, December 2015, and bingo, it works. We observed this also with SWIFT, it's great. Uh, in order to continue with this, my colleague Stefanie Komosser in Bonn, in Germany, uh, started with me together this project called MOMO. And have you guys read MOMO? No? There's a book by Michael Ende, very famous book about time thieves. Very good, and this little girl with her, with her turtle, read it. It's very good. I, there's probably an English translation for it. Um, Michael Ende was very famous with the uh, never-ending story. And he's the same guy who wrote Momo. And so Stephanie came up then with this, this name Momo, after Momo, which is then multi-wavelength observations and modeling of OJ287. And since 2000, 2015, we have monitored really intensively this object with SWIFT, with Effelsberg, which is a radio telescope in Bonn, or in the Eiffel Mountains close to Bonn. Also, we can use public data from a gamma ray observatory called Fermi, and then we have additional observations with other X-ray observatories. Here is XMM and Newton and also NewSTAR. And these are flares that came after these secondary flares. And that all made sense. But again, we can continue monitoring the source. And uh, again, it, this model makes very, very precise predictions of the uh, when you have the 18 billion solar mass black hole. And it says, said first, well, there will be uh, there will be a flare in August uh, 2022. Well, one problem is OJ287 is sun constrained for SWIFT uh, at during this time because the problem is that if, a source, if the sun is moving over the sky, right? Well, not the sun is moving over the sky. We with the earth move around the sun and then the sun looks like it's moving over the sun, right? Over the sky. So sometimes the sun is getting too close uh, to the object and we cannot observe it this swift. That's what the sun constraint is. usually lasts for about three months. So we cannot observe it during that time. Too bad. But we can observe in the radio and we don't see anything dramatic in the radio. Then we started observing it again in September. Next prediction was, after that didn't work out, was in October. Well, let's try that. Okay, let's see if there's a flare. No, not really, right? Because there's nothing in x-rays here. Mm, a little bit here in the ultraviolet, but nothing really dramatic and nothing in the radio either. Gamma rays up here don't show anything dramatic either. Then they said, OK, it wasn't October. We were wrong. Some parameters change it. And we go to December. Didn't work either. Well, um, let's see. Well, we didn't see it either. Now, here's another question. If you have an 18 billion solar mass black hole, how do you hide it? <laughs> you don't. Under the bed. Under the bed, yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, you don't, because this would be one of the largest black holes in the universe. Remember, this thing, the Schwarzschild radius, right? It scales directly. The sun has three kilometers, two miles in, in radius. Now you go to 18, a black hole that is 18 billion times larger. Well, you end up with the radius of this black hole, of the, Schwar of the Schwarzschild radius, of uh, 54 billion kilometers. That is what? 40 billion kilometers, okay? That is 360 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So the solar system, when you go out to Pluto, is 40. So this thing is nine times larger than the solar system. And that's just the size of the black hole. If this thing has an accretion disk, I mean, we would resolve it at some point. It's, it's so big. The other problem you're facing is that the evolution of a black hole goes together with the evolution of the galaxy, which means that if you have a smaller black hole, it's in a smaller galaxy. It also means that if you have a large black hole, it's in a huge galaxy. Like when you look at the galaxy M87 here, that's the one I showed you the picture from the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, right? So when you look at that thing, well, that thing is about 200 times larger than our Milky Way. So it scales. So if you have a black hole that is not 4 billion solar masses, but 18 billion solar masses, well, then you end up with a... Oops, mistake here. So this is four times larger. But you would see it even at this distance of, uh, of, of, um, of 200, what is it, uh, 5 billion solar masses, uh, 5 billion 
light years away, you would still see this object. Well, people have tried this. Okay, so here are some optical images of M87, and then there is a comparison star next to it, and then you can do some deconvolution with, you know, you take the resolution of the telescope, how the light is, you know, broadened out through the telescope, etc. You can do that, and then you can see for the star there's nothing left over, but for M87 there is something left over here, but it's not huge. It's not what you expect from an 18, solar 18 billion solar mass black hole, so you don't see it. Now, the next thing you can do is, well, we deal with an active galactic nucleus, right? So you have a supermassive black hole in the center, you have the accretion disk. What I didn't tell you before is there are also gases in the vicinity of the black hole. So they move in orbits around the black hole, right? Well, that's good, because if they move in an orbit, guess what you can do? You can measure the velocity, you can measure the radius, and with both of them, you get the mass. And when you do this, well, there we go. You look at the optical spectrum, that's the optical spectrum of M, uh, OJ287. This is a hydrogen line, so hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. So you find this everywhere. And this is an oxygen line over here. So what you need to do is you need to measure the width of these lines, and the width of the lines give you the velocity. I mean, this is outside of the vicinity of the black hole, but we can use this as a parameter to measure the mass of the galaxy, which is then linked to the black hole. And then this one is a direct measurement of the black hole mass. So you measure the width of the line, you get the velocity. Then from the luminosity, there are some relations. So when you measure how bright the object is, you can get a relation how far away these gas clouds are from that central black hole. So when you do that, well, it doesn't add up. You don't get a black hole with 18 billion solar masses because that hydrogen line should be much, much more massive, should be much, much broader, and we don't see that. What you're getting is about 180 million solar masses, so a black hole that is about uh, a hundred times smaller than the prediction before. The binary black hole model at the end of the day will still hold, but we have to adjust the parameters here. The model itself doesn't work this way, so what are we doing in the future is we will still continue monitoring with SWIFT. This is the SWIFT light curve since we started, actually not me, Stephanie and I started over here, 2015. These were other observations that were done on a regular basis since 2005. SWIFT was launched 2004. Uh, and we will continue doing this. These are the last observations over here. It's not doing too much, but there is a prediction that it will flare again 2025, 2006, uh, 2026. So we will keep going on this thing as long Swift holds. And it has been in orbit since almost 20 years, but these days, you know, it's like your car. They last much longer than they used to, right? Um, and that's, that's the same thing with, you know, space platforms as well, with satellites as well. They last significantly longer. So then we can look at the new flares coming up, and we do this in all wavelengths. We are not only doing this here in the optical UV and in X-rays. We monitor this in the radio. We will continue doing this. We will do this also in gamma rays, which is, you know, free data that we get. Um, it will be interesting times to see when it flares again and then, you know, adjust the theory and then see what the measurement is. The other thing we need to do is we need to have a better optical spectrum. This one wasn't very good. We need probably also some infrared spectra to look at some other lines uh, and then look deeper to get better measurements of this. So I hope this gave you a little bit of an overview about black holes, in particular this object OJ287. And if you have questions, well, let me know. Otherwise, Mark, uh, you are monitoring online. If you have a question, just raise your hand. And the, the virtual audience, uh, there's a Q&A function. We'll uh, monitor those. So you have one black hole rotating around the other. Yeah. Then the uh, OJ287 is the stationary black hole, and the other one's moving around it. That's they're, not, they're never stationary. That's they always move around the center of mass. So kind yeah. Of yes, correct. It's a small emotion like this, right? Of things operating going around OJ287 and another black hole. That's an excellent. Yeah, that's an excellent question because what you are measuring probably is a is a uh, is a broadline region or these gases that are around those those two together. But so you measure the total mass of them. But you, you still have the effect of the other black hole correct. going on that mass. Right? Yes, you correct. Okay, you do. So do you, how do you calculate and cancel that out? Or? No, it's not cancel out. It's the total mass that you are measuring. Oh, you're, okay, you, you, yes. Yes. So if your if your mass if you have the two black holes here, right? If it's some model like this and they go around the center of mass there and the gases are around here, you measure the total mass of the two together. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you said that 
one method gives you 180 million and mm -hmm. the other gives you 4 billion. How do you know which of those is correct? No, no, no. The, the 180 um, million is the mass for, for OJ-287. The 4 billion is the one for M87. I know it gets oh, confusing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's okay. This is, this is the one for, uh, this is a different galaxy. Different galaxy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good point. Tristan. So, um, you, uh, so this one was an incorrect uh, calculation because it was presumed the 18 billion before, now it's 180 million. Yeah. Do you think there are other binary uh, black holes? Yeah, there are. Yeah. There are, because we can resolve them actually in x-rays. There are some that are close enough that we can resolve them. There are, sometimes you have to use some statistical methods because the number of uh, photons you're getting is very small, but there are some statistical methods that can tell you that this is actually a, a binary system of black holes. Do you and think there's other um, systems that might also have incorrect uh, like masses? Like this one be, let's say there's like a presumably black hole 25 billion solar yeah. systems. And do you think that that also, might, if it's in a binary system, do you think that could also be uh, less than what we think? Mm. Or I don't think so because, you know, as long as you have the, the black hole measurements that you're typically getting is from these measurements of the emission lines, right? When you look at spectra like not this, there are better spectra like these ones. And from that you can derive the black hole mass very precisely. Um, the, with O87 it was a little bit backwards because they had the light curve, they had to come up with a model that explains the light curve and in order to explain the light curve they came up with a black hole mass that is 18 billion solar masses. But then your problem is of course, well you can do measurements, right, that would give you a direct measurement of this black hole mass and we finally looked into this and said wait this is not working, your predictions prepare, say there are flares when they are not and you modify the parameters at, to some point as does that it fits, it, that's not how it works, right? So you can do a measurement that independently would give you the black hole mass and they don't match up. So I would say for the other ones, you are typically, when you do this thing with the spectroscopy, you're usually good by a factor of two or three, which for astronomers is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I know when we talk about budgets, it's probably not so fine, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, recently, they came up with an alternative to LIGO uh, by measuring. Um, I don't know what they're measuring. They're measuring the. Uh, the gravitational waves? Yeah, gravitational yes, there are, more, there are more gravitational wave detectors than LIGO these days. There's also Virgo in Italy, yeah. there's also Kagra in Japan, and now LIGO is expanding into India. They're building a third one in India. So at some point by the end of this dec decade, we will have six online, uh, we, will have, yeah, we have the three LIGO, we have Kagra, we have Virgo, so we have five gravitational wave detectors. Do you think that that will either help or inform your, your research? Um, not for this object, because the spectrum you can observe, the mass spectrum will not fit this. What we need are then space-based observatories. And they will be coming on the European uh, Space Agency, ESA. They want to launch a mission called LISA, which was originally proposed by NASA. But they will uh, launch it by the mid-2030s, 2040 probably. And what they are doing is they have this Michelson interferometer with three satellites. Now your arms are not four kilometers or you know two or three miles long anymore. They are millions of miles, literally speaking. So with that, you're actually in the range where you can actually look for merging supermassive black holes. Or you look at the gravitational wave signal from merging or rotating or orbiting supermassive black holes. But those are thermal? Did you say no, thermal? no, that's not thermal. That's gravitational waves. Okay, the, the this free is, satellite system is... Oh, oh, yes. What they do is they, they have three free-flying satellites. Um, Oops, okay, doesn't work, okay, sorry. So what they do is they have, you know, basically they have the, the one unit that sends out the laser light, they have another unit over here, another one, and this is basically, they are, literally speaking, millions of miles away. And uh, so, so you have the laser light going here, you have the reflection over here, and then you measure, uh, you measure the signal together in this, in this unit again. So they are free flying. Using laser, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are using a laser light in order to determine what the distance is.
between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kupi, I wonder if you could uh, correct maybe a mistake that I read in Wikipedia before I, I came. <laughs> <laughs> They referenced your two papers, the one in the Astrophysical Journal and the one in the Royal Society. The monthly notices? Yeah, they talked about your papers and referenced those in the Wikipedia article. They claimed that the primary was 100 million solar masses, but the secondary was 125 million solar masses. That doesn't make sense, right? Because then the primary would be the 125. Yeah, yeah. The, the smaller one is the secondary, right? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. That's what they claimed in this, this article. Now, that's what I wonder if you could. No, uh, it's not. I mean, that's wrong. That's wrong, yeah. So, yeah. so is the primary 125 then and the secondary is 100? Um, I think that doesn't add up. When we go from this model over here, the primary has, has to be, if the primary is something like 120, then you add up with 60 million solar okay, masses. So you have to add the two, two, two together, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, Clearly yeah, well, that happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes, honestly, sometimes Wikipedia is great, in particular when you look right. up astronomical right. stuff. Right. Here yeah, it's, it's yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, yeah. yeah I, have, um, I was trying to follow the difference in the black holes in our galaxy versus another. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm not an astronomer, so I don't know this, but and some galaxies things go around it, don't worry about our galaxy, we're not going to be sucked into the black Correct. hole. Correct, yes. That happens when you have, this is what my brain said, friction. Um, yeah, when you, do you need, uh, do you need to get friction. rid of the angular momentum, right? So what's the friction from? It's coming from the interaction of the particles. So basically, um, you have this hot plasma, the, 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 um, the plasma still interacts with each other, and he, I'm not a chemist. Um, <laughs> but you, you basically you have to get it's like like uh, when a satellite is in the upper atmosphere right um, when you have a low earth orbit satellite that through friction lowers its orbit mm -hmm. now you're doing this with 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 gases itself so they move around in different layers so they basically move around on each other and uh, slow each other down the heat has to go somewhere that you develop heat this way and that is coming through you know, process that is actually also viscosity. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the viscosity, you can then generate the heat that we see in X-rays in the equation. So you, you get rid of the angular momentum and the matter, matter can finally fall into the black hole. But why doesn't that happen to all black holes? Oh, good point. Why is the, 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 the center of our, like, our galaxy not active? Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, now I understand your question. Okay. <laughs> Only 10% do this, and the reason is you typically deal with galaxies, they are in some kind of interaction. So you disturb the gas. The gas is not just falling voluntarily into the uh, center of the galaxy. So you need some kind of disturbance in order to do this. So when you have galaxy interaction, well, that's a natural phenomenon, right? Because now all of a sudden you disturb the gas in the galaxy, and then the gas will funnel into the center of the galaxy. That makes a little bit more sense, right? Because you are right. I mean, why don't we see this in our galaxy? Why is the Andromeda galaxy, which is so close to us, not an active galactic nucleus? Why is the closest one something like M87, which is a hundred, I don't know, a hundred some light years away from us? I don't know how much the distance was. Um, there it is, 200 times. I don't even know what the distance is of M87, but it's something like a hundred million light years away from us. Yeah. Ready for a virtual question? Yes. What uh, do we uh, not know about black holes that we would like to know, or what's uh, the next revelation? What, uh, oh. You've described all this discovery over the past Yes, so. yes. So I think, there, I think there is a lot of stuff we, we don't know. Um, for example, we don't know why we have black holes with uh, the supermassive black holes that exist already at the beginning of the universe. So when you look at the first galaxies, the first quasars, we have already black hole masses with billions of solar masses. How do you form them? We don't know. We know that we can form stars. We have, you know, gamma ray bursts which explode and they, make, they, they end up with something like a few solar masses. How do you get from a few solar masses to billions of solar masses? Well, how do you grow black holes? Well, there are two ways to grow black holes, right? One thing is, well, we throw matter onto them through accretion. Well, 
But that is a relatively slow process. That works for the smaller ones that you accrete relatively quickly matter. But there's a problem to it, right? If you accrete too much matter, the thing becomes too luminous, and then you have another effect. You have light pressure. You have radiation pressure that pushes matter out. So if you become too bright, you don't get the matter in anymore. Actually, the matter moves outwards. So that stops it right there. The other thing is you can, you can merge black holes. Okay, that's what we observe, you know, in some galaxies you merge black holes and we form larger ones. The problem is that also takes time. You don't have that time. We don't know why these black holes are there. Another problem we have is, well, we know solar mass black holes exist, right? We can see them. We see them also in some black hole candidates in our galaxy. We know gamma ray bursts. They form black holes with solar mass black holes. We have the supermassive black holes with millions and billions of solar masses, but we have nothing in between. We have not found uh, black holes with intermediate black hole masses. We have not found black hole masses with, mil with hundreds, thousands, or 10,000 solar masses. They start with a supermassive black hole, several hundreds of thousands solar masses. But below, we don't know. That's, that's an excellent question. Those, those are basically the, the main questions we have about black holes, and we don't understand. Don't go <laughs> Just follow up. So you're saying the smaller we're, we're seeing the gap between the very small and the very large. It's at the middle. It's the middle. Okay. We don't know. So we can observe the small ones. We can observe the big ones. It's, it's not an observation. Problem. It's not an observation problem. Okay. We don't find them. Okay. Uh, there may be some that we think they are in the 10,000 uh, solar mass range. The ones they were found by gravitational wave detectors, they were in that range on the lower end with something like 30 solar masses. So that was good, that's a start, right? But we still don't see something like 2,000 solar mass black holes. So where are they? They should be there. If we have a continuous growth of black holes going from the small ones to the supermassive ones, there should be some in the middle. But we don't see them. Galaxy age? Well, then you would expect that they get uh, larger, right? Well, I mean, the younger galaxies would have the smaller black Sure, right. But the galaxies itself, I mean, you're right. But they are the ones, the, so to speak, the younger ones, so to speak, are the ones with the several hundred thousand solar mass black holes. They are not a galaxy with something like 10,000 solar mass black holes. They are dwarf galaxies. So people look at dwarf galaxies and see if there's anything in them that would, you know, show them uh, black hole masses of tens of thousands of solar masses, but so far nothing. Okay, class. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a test. I'm going <laughs> to recap what I've learned, and you can see. If okay. You get a good grade. Uh, <laughs> be careful playing with marshmallows. Yes. <laughs> Einstein was really smart. Yes. <laughs> and Dirk always wanted to be a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> I want to remind you that. Uh, 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 the, the volunteers and team here at the observatory. Uh, you can see uh, uh, one of the telescopes here, I believe, and uh, with a more modern telescope, uh, uh, assuming the sky is clear when we go out, there's some galactic things to look at. Yes. Uh, 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 so, yeah, so, so uh, uh, have a little fun here at the observatory and, and come back. Uh, the uh, uh, Quick, uh, let me just let you know our next uh, six at six. See, by the way, it's called six at six because when we started, there were six lectures. They were at six p.m. and they cost six dollars. We're now free. So, uh, <laughs> we're at, six, at six, at six, at six. But uh, uh, our next one is uh, November the 9th, also at six p.m. and it'll be on campus in the digitorium. And we have Julie Pace. Uh, so it's a different kind of black hole. We're going to talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> Associated Press, and uh, she will talk about some of the challenges of uh, covering the news as it is uh, right now. So join us uh, on campus on the night. Also, not a six at six, but an NKU activity Monday night. Uh, uh, everybody, of course, is welcome to tune in. The Kentuckians, and especially NKU, is hosting a gubernatorial debate. You can watch it uh, on WCPO or online at link NKY. So uh, that, that's uh, will be kind of. Uh, Nice evening of uh, understanding where the state will be next. Um, the, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, if you go to our website, you'll see the rest of the season. But in January will be in Augusta, 
uh, Augusta, Kentucky was a center of uh, abolitionism in an environment of slavery. So we're going to uh, talk about that. Uh, so uh, interesting season, fun season, fun to be at these places that are related to our topics. Uh, and uh, I want you to join me in thanking 